uh, it's just really a pleasure uh, to be here today with you. Um, as Pierre Luca mentioned, 102 days ago, I resigned my tenure as a faculty member at the University of Illinois to start a company dedicated to the transformation of higher education and other organizations for the unleashing of human creativity. What I'd like to talk about today is some thoughts about how we got to our current position in technical education and talk about some ways out of our, of our current position in ways that will attract more young people, in ways that will attract more uh, women and underrepresented minorities, in ways that will help create um, the world that we all hope for in the 21st century. We've heard from many authors over many years that the world is flat, that there is a rising creative class, um, that you need a whole new mind in today's world, a whole new creative mind. And yet, we continue to teach engineering and computer science and other technical professions in ways that are better aligned with the post-World War II era. So what I'd like to do in this talk is take a look at how we got to our current position and talk about um, where it is that we might go. This is not the answer. And many of you will uh, be disturbed by some of the things that I'm going to say. And in some sense, that's part of the point. Um, if what I say bothers you and gets you to think, then I will have succeeded in, in my talk. If you, if you agree and want to join the growing numbers of people who are helping transform engineering and computer science education in new ways, um, I welcome you to that fraternity. So here's, here's a little bit of a road map as to where I hope we go. Um, I'd like to talk about the post-World War II era and the way in which um, that shaped technical education as we know it. Then I want to talk about the academy generally. And, and uh, you know, I come from an American perspective. I come from the US. I will, I will refer to things historically from the US, but not because um, I, I know where I am. And I'm, I'm using the references to the US because in many ways, uh, the U.S. was um, in a strong position after the war, and many of the things that we see worldwide are manifestations of, of political decisions that were made in the United States post-World War II. I want to talk about three missed revolutions. I want to talk about the Davids and the Goliaths of our current techno-economics. I want to talk about the three O's and the missing O. Um, I want to spend some time talking about what we'll call the missing basics of engineering um, and how academic change is, is similar to the siting of a nuclear power plant. And then um, uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, the way in which the, um, emotion is almost completely undervalued in the transformation of engineering education. So let's get started, and the story, I'll start my story at the end of World War II. And um, much of the world was devastated. Um, the U.S. was in a pretty good, uh, pretty good shape. And the decisions made for the mo the, um, getting t technology and science moving in World War II uh, shaped subsequent decisions to fund science in a big way not only in the United States, but elsewhere. And the, per the person who did that was Vannevar Bush, an electrical engineer at MIT, who was uh, uh, President uh, Roosevelt's um, director of the Office of uh, Scientific Research and Development. That led to the establishment of things like the US National Science Foundation 
and the funding of science by the federal government on a regular basis. Well, that decision to do that had ramifications for what became the research university, the, the Stanfords, the Michigans, the Illinois, the MITs, and so forth, the Berkeleys. Those schools did not exist in that form prior to World War II with the funding of uh, federal research. They became the schools that we recognize now. And along with that came a bunch of other things. Um, the uh, promotion and tenure and, and the emphasis on research. Now, the academy was not really all that much different from uh, large-scale business at that time. Industry post-World War II was, it was big. It was centralized. It was specialized um, in ways that we don't really recognize today. Economies of scale were the dominant uh, economic force. Hierarchy dominated organization of industry. Um, and universities followed suit. More specialization, um, more depart, uh, compartmentalization, um, and, and the like. Now, to some extent, these decisions, the decisions of the academy to fully embrace mathematics and science as the royal road to excellence, um, was in, in part based on the perception that World War II was won by scientific achievements like the atom bomb and radar. And those certainly played a role. And you can also argue that things like the ability to turn out Liberty ships, uh, get that down from 230 days to 42 days, and to create things like the P-51 Mustang um, in 150 days from start to finish. Things like that played a role just as much as um, the, the uh, techno science that was coming into its own at, at the time of World War II. But the effect, regardless of whether, the, uh, whether this was right or wrong in any objective sense, the perception that science won the war um, shaped engineering education in a profound way. And um, engineering thought that it was behind and reports subsequent uh, to the war, the 55 Grinter report in the States and other reports around the world, injected mathematics and science into the curriculum in an unprecedented way and removed design in an unprecedented way. And really the first engineering discipline created after the war chose not to call itself engineering. It chose to call itself a science, computer science. Whether or not these decisions were right or wrong, good or bad, that's not my point here. But the point is to argue that these decisions were made as much on status grounds, and sometimes we think of the decisions made, the decisions made by scientists as always scientific, but certainly uh, decision making on status grounds um, is, an, is in some sense anything but scientific. So let's fast forward a little bit, or maybe a slow forward through the next few decades. And so, um, so we have this hierarchy, we have this specialization, and now what happens? Well, along comes the quality revolution, where companies realign themselves and start doing things like um, Japanese uh, did, borrowing from statistical quality methods invented elsewhere. Um, the world of manufacturing changed in a very dramatic way uh, in the quality revolution. and. Um, not, well, not, un, not necessarily unfortunately, but that revolution was in some sense missed by the academy. Although we now teach quality methods, we don't practice them. You're not going to get ISO 9002 certification as a university, or at least most universities would be unable to do that. And then what happened? If we sort of go forward into other decades, there's the, there's the miracle of Silicon Valley and the, the famous garages that spawn new businesses and, and the creation of the notion of venture capital. And those things changed the world, and those two were missed by the academy. And again, we teach entrepreneurship, but are we really entrepreneurial in the same way? And then, and then the final revolution that we missed was the IT revolution, and of course we teach IT, but do we incorporate IT like, uh, uh, like Dell Computer does, or Walmart, or other global corporations that incorporate IT directly into their, their business processes? And so, 
We miss these three revolutions in the academy, even though we teach them. We're aware of them, but we didn't embrace them the way that the, the real world did. Now, why are these things so important, and why do they keep changing things? Well, if we look under the hood, there are good technical and technological and economic reasons that explain these things. Um, and so the ones that I want to gesture at, I want to gesture at the technological improvements of communication and transport, um, uh, the uh, transaction costs and network effects. So why has this change been so relentless? Well, one of the reasons is because of the reduction in transaction costs brought about by improvements in tech, um, uh, communications technology, as well as improvements in um, um, transportation technology. So is the, is the Japanese onslaught in the world possible without the Boeing 707 or the fax machine? Uh, so these things changed the way business was done. It made the, the cost of doing business less. And so that reduction in, in transaction costs led to, in some sense, a smaller size or scale of business uh, being possible for many companies, where companies, uh, be, in, nobody st uh, stuck to their core competence in the 50s. And everyone talks about doing it in the 90s and the 2000s. And the change was, in part, transaction costs. It made it economically important to specialize on the things that you were really good at. The flip side of this is the returns to network scale. And so that actually goes in the opposite direction. So if you have a, a good that is more useful to more people who use it, then there will be some very large players, the Googles, the Microsofts, and so forth. And so we live in a world of core competence Davids and net networked Goliaths as a result of these, these two um, different kinds of economics. That's very different than the economics of scale that dominated the 50s and 60s. So that's the world we live in, um, economically and technologically. And then when we look around, we see a world of, sometimes I call it the landscape of the O's. You know, so when we talk, when uh, rectors or deans or, or presidents of universities talk about the world, they, they talk about info and bio and nano. Those are the O's. Okay, and so actually if you think about the O's though, two of those are quite different than one of them, right? So bio and nano are terrific for those um, who are accustomed to the, the post-World uh, War II uh, Cold War agreement and paradigm, right? So if it's science push, we know how to do nano and bio. More science uh, drives more technology in, in, that, in that direction. On the other hand, info, is sort of a different animal. It comes from the customer, and the, the uh, innovations that we see are more human-centered in a way and suggest sort of the missing O of our times. So if you think about the kinds of systems that we now live with on a regular day-to-day uh, -day basis, the technology is part of it, but human intentionality is even a bigger part of it. And so um, we might call, uh, sometimes I call that postmodern systems engineering or, um, uh, so, or homo sapiens um, uh, engineering or socio-technology. But the, but, but the point is that, that these postmodern systems um, were either doing something like homo sapiens-centered design or were designing a homo sapiens, so that's things like robotics and engineered prosthesis, or were designing like a homo sapiens. So, Many of my friends from the computational intelligence and evolutionary computation community know what I'm talking about there. But the point is that we need to think about Homo sapiens as not just one thing, but as actor, object, and collective. Now, this is a contrast, a stark contrast, to the way we thought of people in the post-war period. Right? In fact, I love the movie The Right Stuff and the book, uh, Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, because that points out that tension so clearly. The, the astronauts wanted to fly those, those, uh, those capsules, right? And the engineers of that time wanted to get rid of the pilot in the loop because they were just error. So the sense of the post-World War II time was that humans are error in the loop and it needs to be gotten rid of. It's something to do away with. The postmodern the postmodern way of thinking is that humans are the loop. 
Now just think about that just momentarily. Think about Google. Well, Google is about who, who links to whom and things like that. Well, who's doing that linking? Humans are doing that linking. No human intentionality, no Google. And it's even worse in things like eBay. Right? So many of the systems that we now design explicitly have human beings not only as part of the loop, in many ways the human beings are the loop in the systems. And so what are the physics for eBay? What are the equations of motion that govern Google? What are the constitutive relationships for Microsoft Office? And so even asking those questions that way makes, makes us ponder a little bit, where are we now and what is it that we're doing and are we doing the right stuff vis-a-vis -vis the engineers and the computer scientists that we educate? So there's an opportunity now to, to close that gap and to connect those bodies of knowledge that actually have been concerned with human intentionality. We usually call those the humanities or the social sciences. And to connect those dots with um, those that have been mainly concerned with physics, the natural sciences. And here I'm gesturing at C.P. Snow's famous uh, essay on the two cultures to suggest that there's an opportunity now for a kind of humanities uh, push uh, with tech pull into this kind of socio-technology that we see emerging. And, and, and those, things are, those things are happening. Now, what does that suggest for what it means to be a technology professional today. And there are various ways into answering that question. And I thought about which way to tackle today. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to go this, I'm going to go in a very practical way. I've been sort of abstract and sort of philosophical. I've really been arguing from a historical perspective. But let's get practical for a moment. When I joined the University of Illinois 20 years ago, I joined a department called General Engineering. Now General Engineering is a really cool department. It was created in the 20s because Chicago area industrialists were complaining in 1921 that Illinois engineers didn't know enough about business. So that's actually an interesting foreshadowing of some of the pressures that we feel today. But it, and, it's, and it's an interesting one historically because it was at about that same time that business schools started their meteoric rise from um, early, uh, the early start in the late 1800s. But the reason I joined General Engineering 20 years ago was a little farther removed from that. I joined that department because they had this wonderful senior design course where teams of three or four faculty would go solve a real world engineering problem in a single semester where the company would give some amount of money, uh, right now it's about $10,000 US, to solve this real world problem with a company. So the, the company works on it, the kids work on it, and a faculty member goes with these kids to help them solve this problem. Wonderful course, and I said, I need to learn about this course. And so I did it for about 20 years. And one thing that I noticed was that the things that the kids didn't know how to do were the same every year. And they didn't get better and they didn't get worse. They were just the same same list of things that the students didn't know. And so what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is reflect on what it was that senior engineering students, fourth year students, didn't know how to do when they went to solve a real world problem and see if that gives us a clue about how to create the, how to sort of uh, get back to creating um, technology professionals that can actually go out into the world and make a difference. So we'll begin with that end in mind, and here, here we'll reflect on that. And so this is a, think of this. You're with three kids. They're about ready to go out into the world and solve a real world problem. And it's a perfect moment to ask, what is it that they don't know how to do? And so I'm I'll use some examples. Here's the project I'm going to refer to is a project for Azteca Foods up in Chicago. Azteca Food makes uh, Mexican food products, and the particular product we were involved in about four years ago was uh, their, their, their flour tortillas. So there's this huge machine about the length of a football field that makes tortillas, and it's got, um, um, 
in some of my presentations, I have pictures and go through it in more detail. I, I, I didn't do that today. But anyway, so imagine flat sheets of flour traveling quite quickly down this machine. And it goes through rollers to make the, the flour thin. And then it comes to a stamping press that rotates and presses out little tor part, well, they're not little tortillas. They're about this, this size. And our job, and this isn't going to sound fancy or fun, it was a typical industrial engineering problem, was to reduce the amount of dusting flour used. Now, when you, when you bake at home, you probably have to throw flour onto the table and you roll it out. And so it doesn't do what? So it doesn't stick. The, the, men, are, the men are just sitting there and the women are nodding their heads. OK, anyway, so, uh, but anyway, so, the, so, the, so, you, so you, you roll out the flour. And, and, and so we had to reduce the amount of dusting flour. That doesn't sound like a big deal. But as Teca was spending millions of dollars more on dusting flour than they had five years, old, five years before, and they were concerned about it. So, so here, OK, so all right, so send the kids out. What is it that they don't know how to do? Well, you send them out. And they have to go meet the customer. And what's the first thing they don't know how to do? They don't know how to interview the customer by asking good questions. What's, what's, what, what, if I tell bad jokes, does it go off like that? Or? <laughs> they don't know how to ask good questions. So um, um, what, what's been done before? Who are the vendors for your machinery? Uh, when was the last time this was looked at? What have you tried? What have you tried? Ask a whole bunch of questions to try to find what is the real problem? It says that the problem is this. Is that really the problem? They have to ask those questions to make any progress. And so I'm, I'm their coach. I'm their, their faculty mentor. What do I do? Well, I coach them. I say, I tell them, you know, ask a lot of questions. Don't make a lot of statements. Don't show how smart you are. Just ask, you know, find, get, take in information. And, and they did. And usually the students respond to that. But the fact that I have to say that says something about the educational process that they don't know how to do that. And so the point, and actually here I'm going to associate each of these failures with a, a famous personage um, in, in the Western tradition. So what? The, so Socrates taught the Western world how to ask great questions in the 5th century BC. Now, asking about tortillas is, asking, is different than asking about love and beauty and things like that, but nonetheless, to ask Tekka Foods, asking those questions is just as important. So, that's, so it's a failure of Socrates 101 not to be able to ask good questions. Now what else don't they know how to do? So you've coached them. They've asked great questions. They got a lot of data. Now they're looking at the data. And they're looking for patterns in the data that will tell them something. And when they find those patterns, what they really need to do is give them names or labels. They need to name things. So for example, in the tortilla line, one of the patterns was that um, we, they told us that sometimes with too much dusting flour, the dusting flour would go into the oven and be burnt and fall onto the tortilla, be shipped to the customer, and the customer would think that the, the, uh, the tortilla was, had mold on it, that there was a quality problem. So we called that the burnt flour problem. Not a very creative name, but we called it something, and we labeled it. And it turned out that. That wasn't really a central problem, but it was important to get it out of the way to be able to solve the central question we were looking at. Um, so that's a little bit interesting that students are uncomfortable with the notion of naming things because it's so important to being able to solve problems. And again, it's also sort of strange because Aristotle taught the Western world how to do that in about the 4th century BC. So, there's, you know, so we go back to Athens and there's lots of hints as to what it is that we should be teaching. Um, that our kids aren't getting. And so we call that, a fail that fi inability to label a failure of Aristotle 101. Well, then what don't they know how to do? Well, OK, so now they've labeled some things. They're sorting things out. And what's their first impulse? It says inability to model. But I actually mean modeling of a certain sort, because they want to plug into an equation bad. I mean, they want to plug into the. They want to plug, if they can plug into Newton's laws or Maxwell's equations, they're so happy they want to scream. But if, this, is a real, this is a real world problem. And if, if the company could have solved this by plugging, doing statics, dynamics, or electromagnetics, they would have already done it by now. So this is, this is a messy problem. 
they weren't taught flower physics in, in, in their dynamics course, and so they actually have to think for a change instead of plugging into a calculation. And so what they don't know how to do is they don't know how to model conceptually. And there are different kinds of conceptual modeling that they don't know. They don't know how to create lists, categorical lists, and they don't know how to do conceptual models. For example, my, before I talked to you about the burnt flower problem, I gave you a, a causal model. Right? I went from um, flower in the air to burnt in the oven to falls onto the, I gave you a causal chain of how that problem arose. Now those are engineering models, but we never really label them as such. And our students don't think they're doing engineering modeling when they sort those sorts of things out. So I encourage them and I tell them, yes, that really is an engineering model. Yes, that might be all you need to do. No, you may not even have to touch Newton's laws or Maxwell's equation to solve this problem. So to some extent, the way in which we educate our students misleads them as to, to the kind of modeling that they routinely have to do, and they find themselves in, unable to do so. And so we might call, what, well, here, uh, here I've got old David Hume because of the connection with causality, or we might call this a failure of Aristotle 102 if we were talking about categorical lists. All right, so now they've sort of got a problem that they're trying to solve, and now they need to solve this big problem by decomposing it into little problems. And of course, Descartes told us about that in the 1600s. Um, and, um, um, but what is it, um, what is it that they, again, they have trouble sorting out the pieces of the puzzle that they should be solving quasi-independently to get to the bottom of it. And so we might, we'll call that a failure of Descartes 101 for their inability to decompose. And then oftentimes the little sub-problems that they need to solve are ones that are, where they're not going to do a computation, but they're going to query the real world, the empirical world, by doing a little experiment. And sometimes those experiments are quick and dirty, and sometimes they have actual measurements on them, but they, there's an inability to, to measure or experiment that is problematic. So you encourage them to do little models. In the case of the tortilla problem, they, were, they actually went and played with dough. They went in, and they went, in, they went out to the line and they looked, they reduced the amount of dusting flour and looked at where the machinery started to stick. So they, they queried the, the real world um, instead of trying to do some abstract computation. So we might call that a pick your favorite empiricist. Uh, I've chosen John Locke here. So that's a failure. Lock 101, or maybe Bacon 101. I do have an Italian in my, my, my listing here. And so, um, and so what? Now they have to actually solve the problem by being creative and by visualizing solution. And so, uh, but they don't know how to draw. We took drawing out of the curriculum about 15 years ago for the most part. Some, some, some curricula still have it. Um, and we de-emphasize the notion of anything but mathematical kind of reasoning and, and creativity isn't something that we, that we even really talk about much in, in the educational process. But So their inability to visualize and ideate the failure of, call it Da Vinci 101, or uh, in France I would say Monge 101, um, is, a, is a real problem. And now finally they have to go and communicate this with their, their sponsors. So they have to write a report or give a presentation and so um, uh, the reference here, um, I've got Paul Newman there, and the reference is to the movie Cool Hand Luke and the famous scene where the warden of the chain gang says uh, to Luke, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And so we call this a failure, this failure of communication, a failure of Paul Newman 101. We call these seven things the missing basics of engineering by counterdistinction to the basics. And so when, I tell, when, I t when we talk to faculty that are fairly traditional about what's missing in engineering education, they'll say, oh yes, our students need to be more communicative. They need, to, they need to reason better. They need to be more creative. But wouldn't those things dilute the basics? Will be the question that's asked. And what does the, that faculty member mean by the basics? They mean math, science, and engineering science. And so in sense, at one point, I'm not against math. Anyone who knows my work knows that I'm not against math science or engineering science uh, by, by any means. But what I'm saying is that in some sense, 
these critical and creative thinking skills, the ability to question, the ability to label, model conceptually, and so forth, that those things are more basic than what we call the basics. And, and they're missing. Our students have trouble with them. So, um, so how, do we get, how do we get those in there? And how do we, and, and I want to make sort of a double argument here for you as well, that by getting them in will be attractive to exactly the kinds of students we'd like to, uh, to get into engineering and, and technical, the technical professions. So let's tie this back to my historical argument that, that was sort of up here. Let's tie it down here in the real world. And I'll argue that there's sort of three conceptual misunderstandings that are blocking this joy of engineering and, and the missing basics. And the three are that engineering is mainly math and science. That's an ontological question. That the world is hierarchical and specialized. We were talking about that before. I want to return to it. And that there's a sense in which these qualitative skills are sort of nice to be a cultured person. Well, being a cultured person is a great thing, but the argument that we're making here is that these things are needed to be a great engineer. Let's look at each of those. So there's a sense when you ask, when you ask uh, engineering faculty or you ask sort of people, um, well, certainly if you ask a physicist, what is engineering? A physicist will say, well, engineering is applied physics. If you ask a mathematician what is engineering, the person will say, well, engineering is applied math. Um, engineers, when reflecting on this, sometimes will say that engineering is applied math and science, but there are other views. For example, Theodore von Karman, the fluid dynamicist and engineer, said a, a scientist discovers that which exists, an engineer creates that which never was. That's not really a definition of engineering, but it's pretty poetic, and, and a lot of engineers like that. Uh, Billy Cohen, the uh, uh, engineer and philosopher at Texas, says engineering is heuristics. Joe Pitt, the philosopher of technology at Virginia Tech, technology is humani uh, humanity at work. Uh, Messini's uh, definition, technology is an organization of knowledge for achievement of practical purpose. I'm going to take a definition of Rogers and modify it a little bit for our context, and I'm going to highlight some terms. And, Again, this is not the definition of engineering. This is a definition of engineering that I'm putting forward. Uh, engineering is the social practice of conceiving, designing, implementing, producing, and sustaining functionally complex artifacts, processes, or systems appropriate to some recognized need. And so the functionally complex separates us from industrial design. Um, the social practice is important and something that's oftentimes missed when we reflect on what engineering education is. The recognized need says that we're, we're not doing this just for kind of fun, we're doing this for people. So there's sort of peop there's, there's people in this two, two places. There are people involved in the practice and this is serves um, a recognized need of, of uh, humankind. So, uh, and, and the uh, icon that I have there is, uh, if, if it's a terrific book, um, if you don't know it, uh, uh, Walter Vincenti's What Engineers Know and How They Know It, that, that takes, a, takes a look at this question of whether engineering is applied math or science in aeronautical engineering through both hi uh, historical and philosophical reflection. It's a, it's a classic if, if you're unfamiliar with it. So this, this notion of engineering as applied math and science is one thing that keeps us stuck. Another thing that keeps us stuck is that people thinking that the world's like it was organizationally, that we still live in these hierarchical and specialized uh, world. And, and, and maybe the paradigm of the Cold War engineer was okay for back then, but if we are in a creative era, if we are in this flat world, then it's fairly easy to outsource, as many companies have done, low-cost and routine engineering to, to China and India and other low-cost countries. And so the, um, the advanced economies are basically left being trying to create new stuff that other people want. And so there's a sense in which the post-war engineer was a category enhancer. We made things run faster and jump higher, but they were existing things like automobiles and airplanes and televisions. The engineer of today is creating stuff that, that has never existed. Think of all the gizmos and gadgets and computer programs that we use this very moment that didn't exist two years ago. And think, uh, think of the volume of those things that are coming into our lives. So it's this explosion in 
category creation that we need to be thinking about. We, and it's not that we forget about category enhancement, it's just that that is the difference with the way things were. Okay, and then this third thing that keeps us stuck is that when, now this is, there's a good deal of variation in this worldwide. In the states, there's a fair amount of humanities and social science required in the baccalaureate engineering degree. In different countries, that varies, and sometimes it's just strictly a technical degree, and sometimes there's required, uh, required humanities. I'm actually, I've argued before that it's important to inject some humanities in the education of an engineer, um, but whether you, um, but, but for example in the states, the thinking in, in the 50s was, well we need the engineers to be more well-rounded. Well that's not a bad line of reasoning. I'm not arguing against that line of reasoning, but the thing that was missing was the connection between what's learned in humanities courses and the skills, the thinking skills that engineers really need. And that's the connection that the missing basics brings to the table here. So we're seeking a qualitative, quantitative balance, not to make engineers more cultured, but to make great engineers. And as a side effect, we get other things in the bargain. And so, um, so when we start to do this, and I'm now I'm going to shift and talk a little bit about some of what we've done at iFoundry over the last few years. And so when we when we admitted students into our, our, our incubator program uh, as freshmen, we asked them, well, what do you want to be with your engineering? What do you want to do with engineering? And we got sort of three, we got lots of different answers in particular, but we got sort of three classes of answer. One class was sort of a traditional answer. I want, I want to create cool technology. Terrific. Some kids told us, I want to be the next Max Levchin. Max Levchin was the founder of PayPal, so they were saying, I want to be the next great tech entrepreneur. Super. And then another group of kids told us, I want to save the world. I want to have direct action in the world and, and work on uh, poverty and, and uh, problems in the world. We said, we embrace your aspirations. We embraced all of those aspirations um, as part of what we were doing, and we, and, and we talked about them explicitly. And I'll say, I'll talk a little bit about ways in which we, we brought those in. Now, when you unleash the joy of engineering through the missing basics, and by changing the, the language that you use about engineering, some cool things happen. So for example, one of the things that happened, um, it, it used to be a common place in the states that when an engineering professor would stand up in front of his class for the first time, and it was a he, and, a, and, and uh, back in the olden days, stood up in front of his class for the first time, he'd look out, and, and say, look to your left, look to your right, one of the three of you won't be here next semester. And usually did it with a little bit of a smirk or a smile on his face. Now it was statistically accurate. In the states, the, the, that's something like the, and even still, we lose, we lose, no, I didn't tell a joke, I didn't tell a bad joke then. That, some of that homo sapiens postmodern engineering. Um, that's statistically accurate, but it's, peda it's, it's uh, pedagogically improper. And so, um, uh, and what's the assumption underneath saying something like that? The assumption is that, you, that rugged individuals must survive some selective weed out process in order to be successful and competent engineers. The data shows otherwise. Um, Russ Cordy is a colleague of mine in the College of Education at Illinois, and he's, he's, uh, we've been blessed that he's worked with us on iFoundry uh, for the last several years. And, and his uh, dissertation work was about transitions from college to work. So he studied uh, uh, engineers going into the workforce at major companies like 3M and GM and stuff like that. And what he found was that the single most important variable in engineer success at work was their social connectedness into their, into their work group. He's now doing, he's been doing some work lately about the transition from high school into college and, and it's that kind of thinking that has led us to think about the notion of community in, in, the, in the very first year. And so we created something called the iCommunity as part of iFoundry, which was a, a freshman 
a virtual learning community in which uh, students came in and joined teams aligned with their aspirations. So we had four teams in the first semester of our pilot. We had 75 kids on four teams. They elected chairs. They had a corporate advisor. Uh, we had IBM, uh, an architecture firm, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. We had uh, uh, Hewlett Packard. We had some really great companies work with us, State Farm, um, insurance. And um, the kids were on four teams, art and engineering design, services and systems engineering, entrepreneurship and innovation, and engineering and service to society. Well, there you can see the three, the three aspirations, uh, save the world, be a tech entrepreneur, and, and make cool technology. And each team had a faculty advisor, a student advisor, and an ICO, a corporate and or organizational advisor. And so now, in that kind of setting, in a more supportive community setting, <coughs> Look to your left, look to your right, the framing is different. We say those are the two people who will help you make it through a challenging uh, educational experience. And we actually urge the students to work together and form uh, study teams um, and support each other. So it becomes, instead of it being competitive, it becomes cooperative in a way that's really quite beautiful. So now you think about, well, what kinds of skills does somebody need to be more effective under this joy of community. Well, you need to ask good questions. You need to understand other people's use of language. You under, need to be able to label challenging problems. What? You need the missing basics. And, and that's the way we frame the missing basics. It's sort of a, we frame it as a multi-purpose tool that makes you a great engineer and also makes you good in organizations. So we do that. Now, what about the way in which we, we teach and in the way in which our students learn? Every, you know, everyone says, oh, lifelong learning, lifelong learning. We need all of our students to be better lifelong learners. So in the old model, students were passive vessels, and I, as a professor, would pour stuff into their heads. And usually it would overflow on the first day, and, 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 uh, and it just kept overflowing. But even, even if the the knowledge we were pouring into their heads would stick, the world they live in isn't a world where the knowledge we pour in today is going to be relevant tomorrow. And so um, if we have a world of category creators, these people need to be able to learn stuff on the fly that they need to know to solve problems that they discover. Now, that's not just me saying so. There's research on tech visionaries and serial innovators, it says so. My colleague, Ray Price, is, is co-director of iFoundry. And he's done some really cool research with Bruce Vojak and Abby Griffin on tech visionaries or serial innovators, where they've studied people at Procter & Gamble and Intel and large companies who have created large amounts of new product business. So what is it that these people do that makes them so effective at creating technological products that are really big? And, and um, there's really two things that I want to highlight here from the research. The research is interesting. I urge you to go look at it for, uh, for yourself. But it, the points that I want to make here are two. One is, is that tech visionaries are incredibly great problem finders. They don't wait for marketing to tell them what problem to solve. They go out and look for it. And they talk to customers. And they find, they find a big hole in the market. And, and they fill it. And then the other thing is that they're really good at, um, at, at learning, at doing a deep dive. So sometimes we say we want T-shaped engineers. We want engineers who are broad and deep in something. Tech visionaries or serial innovators are dynamic T's. They're broad. They have a specialty, but they can dive into another specialty enough to go solve the problem in that specialty that, of the problem that they find. Because if you're a problem finder, it may not align very well with the things that you studied in school. So you better have the facility to go outside of your specialty to learn enough to be able to build new products and services that haven't existed before. Actually, we had a great lecture just uh, last week at, um, at Illinois. It was a, a woman named Nancy Dawes, who works for Procter & Gamble on their Olay line of products of skin care, women's skin care. The, the science and engineering that was brought to bear was really cool, but it was integrated in a very interesting way. And all that when 
talking to Nancy over dinner, all the things about labeling and, and the integration of marketing and understanding how customers think, as well as doing great science and great technology came together in a really cool way. And so, but the, the bottom line here is that these people dive into new areas and they have to be able to, to learn new things on their own. Well, what do you need to be a great lifelong learner? Well, you need to ask great framing questions. You need to learn the language of a new area with which you're unfamiliar. You need to collect new data in that situation. You need to come up with creative solutions appropriate to the situation. You need the missing basics. And so the point that I'm making here is that there's this vision of realignment around the missing basics has kind of a systemic coherence, right? It has this, it has this joy of engineering joy of community and joy of learning tie to it in ways that direct us in practical ways into thinking about the kinds of things that we're teaching in a different way. And the, the community also brings kind of a social connectedness under the hood that, that can, can do things uh, for us. So what's holding us back? Why is it that we can't get something like this more into the curriculum? Because after all, if you change the language a little bit here and you go read some of the reports that have been written, in Europe and Asia and elsewhere about what engineering education needs, what do they say? Well, you need more communication, you need more, you need more thinking skills, you need more creativity. It's the same list reframed a little bit differently. So what is it that's preventing us from getting it into our way of, of educating technical, technology professionals? Well, I would say it's pretty simple, actually, but it's, it's it's simple to describe and hard to change. And so here it is. The university is a medieval structure. Goes back to medieval times. So that's university 1.0, you know, 12th century, 13th century. We got our last upgrade organizationally by the Germans in the notion of the creation of the notion of an academic department in the ninth, in the uh, 1800s. So that's University 2.0. And basically, we haven't changed the organization of the university since. We've tweaked it a little bit here and there. We, we sort of have the specialization that I alluded to in the post-war era. And we have, we have directors of research and directors of this and directors of that. We have some specialization. But we really haven't changed the fundamental organization and the fundamental um, way in which curriculum changes. Because the university was designed back at a time to preserve what was a reasonably stable body of knowledge. Of course, you know, we can look at the way in which Newtonian physics entered the, um, um, entered the academy through the uh, Royal Academy, through, you know, sort of outside normal channels, but it got in by various means. And so there were things that were able to get in to the university uh, as long as they could be added sort of separately as, and as add-ons. But what's the problem that we have today? Let's bring it down to the level of an academic unit. So an academic unit department head says, hmm, the things Professor Goldberg's saying are marvelous. Let's change the curriculum tomorrow. tomorrow. So what would happen? Well, so everyone would say, oh, yes, wonderful talk. Loved all that stuff. Curriculum transformation is great. We need, we need 21st century engineers. Just don't change my course. And so then what would happen? So this person that doesn't want his or her course changed would say, Psst, you vote not to change my course, and I'll vote not to change your course. In, the po in political science, that's called log rolling. So the dynamics, the organizational dynamics of the academy are such that whenever change is contemplated, it is unlikely to take place, unless you go create something new. If you try to change an existing department, it will be incremental, and it will be done by consensus, usually uh, because uh, there's a crisis somewhere where if you don't do it, you face existential threat that will put you out of business. So how do we, how do we overcome that in a way? And, and, and it's a serious problem because many of us join the academy because we like being able to vote. We like to be able to, what, every academic has at least one opinion on, on, on every subject. And that's part of why we become academics. So I, I, I'm, some of this I'm saying tongue in cheek, but I'm saying it 
with a profound understanding of why it occurs and having watched it happen over many years. So what's the basic bargain that will break this logjam? Well, there's two pieces to this. One is innovation, and the other piece is the political process, the vote, faculty governance. And we'd like both. We want innovation and we want to preserve faculty governance. Right now, innovation is held hostage to faculty governance. So what iFoundry does is it cuts that knot and says, okay, we will allow innovation to take place, curriculum innovation to take place on a pilot basis in a pilot setting that is a joint effort of all those people, all those units that would like to have innovation take place. And for that innovation to become permanent, faculty still need to vote in the way that they've always voted since the Middle Ages. So we preserve governance and we allow innovation to take place. And there are other pieces to that. You want it to be collaborative. Don't do it by yourself. Do it with other departments. Bring in other people from outside engineering. We have people from art and design and history and philosophy and communication working with us. That creates a more creative environment. Um, use the existing authority of your dean or your rector or whomever, whatever chain of command you're in, to allow the pilot to take place with students who will get accredited degrees even though they've done things that are slightly different from the prescribed curriculum. So don't go through a change, you know, don't send up to the Ministry of Education a change in your curriculum while you're testing it. Allow, do, usually there's some process where a dean or somebody can, uh, or a department head, somebody can sign off on, a, on an excursion from a curriculum and somebody can get a degree. Use that process as a way to permit the pilot. And pay attention to scalability. What? We, people come to the university, they want to do research. We're not saying that everyone has to become 24-7 dedicated uh, pedagogue. We are saying we can have a more exciting kind of education for our students at comparable costs of faculty time and resources. Now how do you do this? Well, one thing is it's really helpful to have a good model. And the Franklin W. Olin College of Engineering was established, oh, about 10, 11 years ago. And I think they've graduated five or six classes now. At a billion dollar grant was given, essentially, by the Olin Foundation to create a new engineering school because the Olin Foundation was tired of giving money to engineering schools to build buildings and having absolutely no effect on the curriculum in those um, in those programs. So they said, let's create a new engineering program as a beacon to the 21st century engineer. And um, have any of you, anyone in the audience been to Olin College? Or has anyone read about or heard about Olin College? No? OK. Well, so uh, there's, cool, there's, there, uh, there's an article on Inc.com on Inc interviewing Rick Miller uh, just this last week about it. If you type in Olin College, you'll get a fair number of articles in the New York Times and elsewhere. Anyways, Olin College is a, is a really interesting um, reorganization of technology education. And, and there are lots of things to talk about. The one thing I want to talk about isn't what most people talk about. Most people talk about their curriculum and uh, talk about their design projects. And those are fabulous. And I can talk to you about those if you're interested. But what I want to talk about is an experience that I had on February 2008, it was the opening days of iFoundry, and we had a class called Design the Engineering Curriculum of the Future at Illinois with 18 students in it, six graduate students and 12 undergraduate students. And we were going and visiting uh, schools in the area. We went to Purdue, we went to Rose Holman Institute of Technology, and two graduate students and I went to Olin. And so we were, it was the afternoon, it was in the afternoon, it was like about this time of day, and, and um, the students were in a class, so see, these were freshman students, first year students. They were in this, this class, um, second semester, so second semester, first year course on uh, engineering modeling, uh, engineering analysis of distributed systems. And they were using some uh, heat transfer codes to design heat sinks. And that afternoon they were testing the heat sinks. 
So they had some time, they were just talking. So the professor said, go talk to these guys from Illinois. So these kids came over and um, what I was struck with was, for, well they're very bright kids and, the, and they're, they're chosen, they're, they're a fairly elite group, they have very good test scores and grades. But that, it, wasn't the, it wasn't their intelligence that, that struck me that, that afternoon. They were bragging about the things they had built in their first year. They were bragging about the little robot they had built in Design Nature, one of their cool courses. They were bragging about the predecessor to this course as a, uh, a, an analysis course of lumped parameter systems where they had to work with uh, op amps and oscillators as well as mechanical devices as escapements. And they, so they were bragging about one of the, I remember this one student, they were, their students were bragging about their colleague had built this really cool clock device out of essentially Legos. And, um, and so I, what I was struck with that was I was talking to engineers emotionally. These kids were engineers in their hearts. And it was so beautiful because I knew that I was, they, they had a lot to learn, but I understood that they understood what it meant uh, emotionally to be an engineer and how cool that can be. And I said, if we can only bottle that and get that to Illinois, we'll, we'll be there. And I, I imagined some distant day when that might happen. So we, we went back to Illinois and, and we cranked up by Foundry in our first year we had, uh, it was 2009 where we admitted freshmen. It's not that long ago. This fall, uh, we've had two cohorts. Our third cohort will be this, this fall. And so uh, this diagram is what we did that first year. And the three balls in the middle, I mentioned the I community that I described where the kids, and the I community was extracurricular. Students signed up for I Foundry freshman experience but they did that voluntarily uh, because they were part of that freshman experience. And then we had a, 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 cr a course called Introduction to the Missing Basics of Engineering that had two parts of it. One part was to do a, two projects and another part was um, the Missing Basics part. Now that course was a modification of a zero credit freshman course that we made into one credit hour. So the course lasted 15 weeks and, and it got one credit hour and it met twice a week. It was, there was some, essentially some lab work and you can have more, more hours of work in the states for um, lab courses. So it wasn't a lot of coursework and if you had asked me in 2000, the fall of 2009 what we would be doing in the fall 2010, I would, I would have told you we would have been beefing up this experience because it wasn't enough. It wasn't anything close to what they, what they were doing at Olin. In addition, we had sort of a, a time frame. We launched with our I launch. We had a midterm checkpoint we called I checkpoint, and we had a, um, an exposition at the end called I expo. And we bathed the students in, in, in joyful language, the joy of engineering community and learning. We admire your aspirations and we respect your choices and we're here to help you create your identity as an engineer. So we reframed what it meant to be an engineer and we did this little tiny baby experiment. So what happened? Well, so fall 2009, 2009 came and we did the launch on uh, 22nd of August and we took the uh, 73 kids out to a, uh, there's a summer camp that has a low ropes course. We did some team building, uh, we, we did a, a reframing of it, we talked to them about these concepts. I, I talked to them about the missing basics and joy, the three joys and so forth. And, um, and the launch tested very well. Kid, it, we, did, we, we had people involved from our College of Education to help us assess everything that we were doing. And that tested well, but it wasn't smooth immediately after that. And, and it was, but it wasn't smooth in a very interesting way. And you can actually see the ways that, um, we had the kids blog doing this. They had to do seven blog posts over the course of the semester. You can go, they're online, you can go look at them. And in September and October, the blogging was sort of negative. They said, wow, these guys in iFoundry, they don't know what they're doing. This is so, I don't, what, is it, what do they want us to do? And we heard that from them as well. Um, it, it was a little bumpy, and it was bumpy in the following way. 
they were on these teams. So for example, some would be on the art and engineering design team and they elected a chairman. But there was nothing that they had to do as part of that team. So they would come to us and say, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, I don't know. You wanted to create cool technology, go for it. Or some, the entrepreneur said, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, I don't know. What, uh, you said you wanted to be an entrepreneur, go build something. And the engineering and service to society kids said, uh, what do you want us to do? I said, I don't know. You want to save the world, start saving. And so that was very disturbing because we've always told them what to do. But we did say, but we want you to tell us about what you're doing in October because we'll have this checkpoint thing and so we want you to get up and tell us about it. So you can see them in that top picture is the checkpoint in 2009. You can see some of the kids have t-shirts on. One of the things we said that they could do is create identity for themselves. So many of them put up websites and created t-shirts. We said, go have a life. Um, do things socially the connectedness part. So uh, th they went ice skating and did things like that. We said to help each other academically. We said uh, do projects if you wish with your corporate and organizational advisors. We also said explore the world of work. But none of those things, none of those things were mandatory. So they reported and they did a great job in their presentation. Some teams were better than others, some had done more than others. But all of them felt like they had accomplished something as freshmen by getting up and making this presentation and by organizing themselves. Another thing that happened was their first a project came due in the uh, Missing Basics course. Um, the first project, everyone did, made the same thing. They made these little steam cars you can see in the lower picture. We weren't sure how this was working and so at the end of this first, at the end of the checkpoint, I was standing there and uh, as we, were, we had a Kaizen session, help us improve, help us improve. So Jamie Kelleher, one of our uh, students said, we weren't sure you were serious about us doing what we wanted to do and then we realized you were and it was really cool. And then all hell broke loose in a very interesting way. They started to do stuff on their own. Um, and this is a very incomplete list. Six kids went out to Silicon Valley to a student organized next generation conference. Three applied for as freshmen and got accepted on our technology entrepreneur center's uh, Silicon Valley trip. Uh, no freshman had ever gone before. Jamie Kelleher is actually the, in the orange t-shirt in that upper picture. She's with students from the National University of Singapore on a service project in Indonesia at Christmas time of 2009. Now that's, uh, so the, the story behind that story is more interesting than the picture. I got an invitation from our friends at NUS asking whether some of our kids could go on this trip. I said, cool, great. Then I looked at the date and realized it was right in the middle of our final examinations. But we sent it out anyway. So Jamie goes around to every one of her professors, gets, takes, gets permission to take the exam early so she can be on that plane to Indonesia with her, her new friends. And so, you know, here's the ice skate I mentioned. And, and, and they just kept doing stuff. They ran their own entrepreneurship conference at the University of Chicago without any help from our office. So this, this unleashing of their potential by believing in them was sort of the last piece of the puzzle here. And we were, we were actually surprised by it. We were, it was an upside surprise but it was, it, was, uh, it was very cool and, and, and we, did do some, you know, we did do some assessment. So on November 11th we ran a survey and um, we tested, we asked them to think back to the beginning of the semester and now. And now is November 11th and so the, uh, the question, the uh, statements were these, uh, st the uh, statements and they were uh, uh, Likert uh, responses. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, four is agree, five is strongly agree. These numbers are the aggregates of the fours and fives. So these are the positive responses. I understand the I found revision, 12, only 12% 12 did, 76% did on November 11th. I understand the I community goals, 29 to 76%. I understand the course, 57 to 88%. I feel I foundry is valuable academically, 69 to 80. I feel iFoundry is valuable to making student connections, 84 to 88. That's actually interesting that so many came in for the social connection that we postulated. So those are the fours and fives. 
By the way, if you take the uh, neither agree nor disagrees, the neutrals, that's another 10 points. So if you add 10 to the now column, you can see there's almost no negative in these responses. And then the student, their student words are more interesting than the numbers. I'm sure I made the right career choice of engineering. I might, <laughs> the second one's a little bittersweet. I might not like my future coworkers, but I'll love my job. Sounds like there's a story of teamwork gone bad in that one. Um, making me more confident in my decision to be an engineer. I'm definitely more entrepreneurial. I feel more comfortable being an engineer. My favorite is the next one. Just an overall all-rounded engineer, not just a technician, a human, not just a problem solver. Future looks brighter. So we were, we looked at these results and we didn't understand them actually. We didn't under, how could a one hour taking a zero credit course, making it a one hour course with a little bit of community do this? And, we, and when I started to talk to our friends at Olin about this, I said, you know, we, we haven't done any of the rearrangement of curriculum. We've got a very, you know, we've still got the math science death march and the engineering science desert of a traditional Cold War curriculum. And we changed this one hour experience and we got, all th we got this response. And how did that happen? Well, we, we trusted the students, but we think it was more than that. And um, the, uh, the management book by the Heath brothers, Chip and Dan Heath, Switch, talks about a three, sort of three types of eigenvalues that help you make change in an organization. Sort of the elephant is the emotion. Emel uh, the emotion drives change. The rider, the rational part, is sort of the, are the words that you use to talk about what you're doing and the path that you unfold is, uh, is the organizational piece. And we did these in reverse order. We started with uh, iFoundry as, as an answer to a NIMBY problem. We did the missing basics next and then we saw this unleashing of the elephant. And now we talk about this as a smooth change process because in doing it this way we were able to get change without faculty uprising. And, it, and, and that change process is still going on and still being negotiated. It hasn't stopped. It continues as, as I'm talking to you here today. So we've continued to do other stuff. We went from 75 to 300 last year. And uh, we're negotiating the number for this year. We've introduced some courses that we like from Olin. There's a, essentially a, an industrial design course that we injected as a sophomore level course. We had a freshman take it and he did very well. Um, in the pilot. Um, there's a course called Foundations of Business and Entrepreneurship that has a challenge where the students have to start and run a company for four weeks and make a profit. The profits are donated to uh, charity. Um, but the, the, we think that a big piece of this is the intrinsic motivation and some of the research that's been summarized on intrinsic motivation in books like Drive and the like uh, seems to us to have a key to what's going on here that it that it is really important to appeal to what's inside of these students if you want to power these transformation efforts in a significant way. And, and we're also in trying to inject design across the curriculum and, and get some of the best practices in senior design spread more evenly around the University of Illinois. So we've got a number of things that we're working on. In addition, as a consultant and um, a leadership coach, um, I'm working with um, um, schools uh, not only in the United States but in uh, uh, Singapore and Peru um, and, and who knows maybe someday I'll uh, be permitted to, to come here and, and work with, with, with you all on, on these sorts of things. One, one piece I'd like to add to that and I haven't talked about it at all is the piece on um, the, the leadership coaching. Um, I returned to Georgetown University as a student myself to get a certificate in leadership coaching and uh, coaching is not, um, it's not mentoring and it's not consulting. It's actually where you work with people to help bring the leader in them out in a, in a kind of cool process of questioning and, and um, uh, working with individuals as individuals. And, and I've actually started to do, to do coaching of undergraduate and graduate students. I've worked with uh, deans and department heads um, individually to try to um, help manage these more complex kinds of change initiatives. Um, they, require, um, they require a, uh, a kind of positive, uh, forceful, kind of positive, not forceful, but a positive kind of uh, leadership 
Um, and uh, I think that the, the coaching is a piece to uh, bringing that about. So we've talked about a number of things. We, we started from the world is flat, needs a, a whole new creative mind that we have a rising creative class. And, and, and we basically are in a world that demands technology professionals who are creative. So how are we going to get there? Well, I think the process that we've talked about is essentially fivefold. We need to understand the world that we live in and how it has changed. We need to understand the curriculum that we're stuck in and why we're stuck in it. We need to know what's missing, and I would argue that it's these missing basics. We need to understand why and respect why it's so hard to change, and then understand the important role that emotion plays in powering um, that change. And if we do these things, we can educate the creative technology professional of the future. Thank you. <laughs>